what is my connection to community media? Um, I've always been an activist, okay, but I've always been a grassroots activist. And I think inadvertently I've always been involved in community media. Because if you're speaking to people at grassroots level and civil society, you're not necessarily going mainstream. You're listening to stories, you're having private conversations, you're having group conversations, you're hearing hearsay. So I think inadvertently I've always been interested, I've been part of community media, but the older I get or the more involved I get in civil society, to me, community media is another way of saying storytelling. And people need to get their stories out. We don't need to hear what Trump has to say or what Erdogan has to say. We need to hear what Aisha is saying, what Mustafa is saying, what Joe Bloggs in the street is saying. So me, to me, community media is listening to everyone's stories, giving a forum for everyone's stories. And how were you in, were involved with community media? Which ways? I've been involved in community media officially, okay. Uh, I was involved in the Cyprus Community Media Center. I was on the board. I'm part of a women's group. So when my CY radio began operating, they brought to speak Achana Kapoor, an Indian activist who's got a community media radio station just outside Delhi, who came and spoke here and only saw 30 people at the meeting and went into panic because she's from Delhi and Delhi is millions of people. But in talking in her conversation to us, I was inspired because what I realized with community media, especially in less developed countries, um, radio allows you to speak without being seen, which means like in India or in the Arab world, you shouldn't be visible. You're not allowed to be visible, but nothing, no one says anything about your voice not being heard. So it was, it, it, she really inspired me and I, when she came, I spoke to her and I actually got her on the air two months ago. I interviewed her in India, on her way to work, driving in the car. So um, that's how the idea came to do a women's forum. Um, I named it Collide Her Scope, which I think is totally ingenious <laughs> because it's collided with the her in the middle. It was, it is a women's forum of talking about issues with um, that either concern women or are discussed by women. But what it's turned into, not that it's changed, but what it's given me, Magda, is it's empowered me because now I can speak to whoever I want. I pick up the telephone, I send an email and say, this is Magda, I host a women's forum on a community radio station, would be honored to have you on my show, give a short bio, in nine out of ten times I'll say yes. I've gone as high as Eve Ansel of the Vagina Monologues. Um, I've also interviewed Aisha or Mariko, who makes bread, okay. But what it's given me, it's actually empowered me as well. And what I love about what I'm doing is that in Cyprus we tend to think we're the center of the world. So we, and we're a small community, so we keep on hearing the same stories. What I believe I've brought, or what it's helped me bring, is I've stepped out of Cyprus because of Skype, because of technology. You can speak to anyone at any time. So I've brought in voices from abroad. I've also taken advantage when we've had conferences here with inspiring women or different women. I've sent emails, you're going to be here, will you give me time? Of course I'll give you time. So th that's my um, role in community media. It actually represents me perfectly because I am a storyteller but I'm more a story asker. I ask the questions. <laughs> I ask the questions that people are usually too scared to ask, but I'm not afraid. I, I don't assume you have, I, there's no expectation that you have to answer. If you don't want to answer, you don't answer and we go on to the next question. I have something. Uh, what you have described, what, how would you be achieving it if you were a member of a mainstream media? I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you compare 
Uh, oh, I'm much fr uh, this, d this is a lot different to mainstream media because I'm freer. I can speak to whoever I want. I can discuss whatever I want. I can use any terminology I want. Okay. So it's a lot... Um, you don't have to be politically correct. It doesn't mean I will allow or I will be impolite or disrespectful. But you don't have to be totally politically correct. You can use... Whoa, betide you use the word vagina, okay? You can use these words. You can... We all have blaspheme. It's part of our conversation. It doesn't matter on community media. It's the tone of what you're saying that's important. Or No, not the tone. It's what you're expressing. So you express it naturally. But the most important thing is you don't... You're not answerable to anyone except your authenticity, yourself. I think that's the most important difference, that you're actually getting out stories because the story you want, you want to say this, this is important, it needs to be heard. So it doesn't matter if Johnson & Johnson is not going to advertise or whatever. But uh, what is your media ethics compass of what you're doing? My media ethics compass is respect. And I know it's a, it's a very fine line what my media ethic, um, ethics compass is. But there's no real aggression. If you want to say something mean or bad about someone, please justify it, okay? In real terms, and not just he's been an idiot or he... It's got to be in real terms. So um, we all have an internal compass of right and wrong, okay? I can't, st I can't go on the air and be libelous about whoever I want. I've got to be able to justify. There is a certain amount of um, a, a rule of law, a, um, an international law. Beyond those, I will not go. I don't. I'm not disrespectful as a person. So if someone begins to sound disrespectful, which has never happened to me, because the subjects I tend to use to discuss are things like um, gender violence or trafficking, and even in trafficking, where you actually want to do the worst things to those men that are trafficking the woman. You can say it, you don't have to use violence, you don't have to be over the top, you can say it in a way that's respectful or real. Maybe that's a better word. But you deal with sen sensitive subjects as are being called uh, abuse, rape, uh, women as a uh, victim of conflict, and uh, how do you approach these stories in order to ensure that your ethics will apply, or the law will apply, like protecting identities? Or what are your considerations? My consideration... When you give the voice of these people out, you have a responsibility how this voice is going to be used furthermore, or your broadcast. So what is your consideration? My consideration is when I interview someone, we actually have a conversation before we go on the air, okay? If they want to remain anonymous, they can remain anonymous. You can actually distort voices. Um, to be honest, I've never been faced with a situation that I've considered that someone has gone beyond what I consider civil or moral. Have you ever been challenged? I have. In fact, once it happened to me, okay, I have been challenged once. We have not only in Cyprus, we have serious cases of parental alienation in Cyprus, okay? Um, we had a case of an American woman approached me. She um, was married to a separate man. She had lost custody of her kids. She was paying uh, alimony. She wasn't really getting visitation rights. No one was listening to her. The law was in place but no one was implementing the law. Um, and she needed a space to talk. And I interviewed her. Um, but with the way I interview, uh, set up the interviews, I actually advertised them three days before. So her ex-husband saw that she was going to be interviewed and threatened me. Okay. He called up, firstly sent me an email, then he called up CCMC, and he was threatening to get everyone at CCMC fired. And I said to him on the telephone, 
I'm making no assumptions that what your wife is saying is true. The only assumption I'm making as a single parent is that children need to have both parents and it's the children's decision of whether they will step away from a parent. It's not my decision. Um, so you're very welcome to come and join in the conversation or I can interview separately. He was just threatening and the one reason I did step back is because I was not aware of the law. Okay, so the way I got around that, okay, is that her interview I did not air because she identified herself, um, she, it would have been easily identified who was talking about what. So the way I got around that is that I got four people in the same position and I interviewed them together and no one was identified. So each person was talking about their parental alienation. No one was mentioning names or anything and that's the way I got around it. But it was quite scary because if it wasn't for the fact that I was part of a collective, I might have aired the interview. But being part of the collective in the studio, I wasn't going to risk the collective of the radio station because this guy was a real jerk and vicious. So I got beyond it by keeping it anonymous. Is it easy to... Go by, you have a question. I think it's maybe, is it easy what you're doing, ethical wise, to follow what you consider to be the best implementation of media ethics? Is it easy? Is media ethics easier to implement? It's the only time I've actually had to think. That instance that I've spoken about is the only time I've actually had to think. I think I'm quite a sensitive person. I don't like to expose people. I expose myself. I'll put myself out there, but that's okay because I'm responsible for me. But I'm, as I said, I can I ask, I ask very direct questions. But I'm also, don't, I also don't expect answers every time. So you expose yourself as far as you want to. I'll ask the questions. You want to take all your clothes off in inverted commas, you can. You want to just keep some of your clothes on, it's fine. So I think my strength is that I do ask the questions, but I don't demand the answers. What is your perspective on media ethics, on the issues you deal with, but on mainstream media? What is the situation there from your perspective? How different are media ethics for mainstream? How they're being right now. For example, you're reading news from mainstream media about things you're dealing with as a community media broadcaster. How do you comp contrast what you're doing with what their rhetoric and the usual coverage on mainstream media? For example, my question was related to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ask, for example, um, I think the, the main difference with what you're doing and what media, mainstream media is not doing is to giving kind of a voice to uh, to people which we call, we can call ordinary, not a politician, mm -hmm. not a celebrity. Voice. Yeah, exactly. So from that perspective as well. I think the, the thing with that community media is different to mainstream media is that in mainstream media, firstly mainstream media is patriarchy. Mainstream media speaks with the men of vo the voice of men. Okay, women don't have a lot of voice, so you get a lot of the issues that I like to bring up, and which is the reason I have got so heavily involved in community media is actually giving a voice to a woman that have been trafficked, hear her story, or a woman who has been beaten up, hear her story because these are not the voices that sell. These are not the voices that a lot of the time mainstream media think are important. So I think mainstream media is very necessary, okay? But they do have a very strict, almost old fashioned way of looking at things. Because they, they I mean, we, it's the sexuals that I'm talking about that are uh, sexual and reproductive rights or gender violence or participation in the peace process, they are so used to talking about them in a specific way. I think it's only recently we've had a lot of cases of women that have been murdered by partners, okay? It used to be called 
a crime of passion, a family affair. It only is in the last year or two that they've started talking about domestic violence. So it's, uh, it's taking a lot of time to use the word, calling things in the way they should be called, not calling them in what is either politically correct or um, the way things used to be. I think community media, what community media has done and which has made standard media almost old-fashioned is that civil society has developed a voice with the help of technology, social media, people have developed a voice, okay. So now they do have platforms and community media is giving them a, maybe helping a channel the voice of, but the voice of social media, the voice of community media is not in main media. It's not there. They forget about it. It's almost uh, uh, on a parallel, in a parallel universe. <laughs> Because in general, uh, media has a role, and it's a very important role in, in democracies uh, to start with. But uh, do you think that community media, because mainstream media doesn't seem like uh, actually reflecting all views and all opinions, so do you think that community media is kind of filling the gaps in that sense, and do you think it's good enough? I think community media has got a very important role to play because mainstream media doesn't cover everything, okay? I don't think in Cyprus we are doing it correctly yet or as three-dimensionally as we could. I'm actually quite sad because I think especially in the times we're living now with the peace process or the fact that the negotiators, the negotiations are really frustrating us all because we're seeing two boys that have got upset and have thrown their toys out of the window. I think we could be doing so much more with community media. Community media means you and I and everyone here could actually speak and they have to listen. But I don't think we are empowered enough. I think community media helps empower but I don't think we've reached the stage yet. So to me we almost, we, we're not there but we not bad. <laughs> How do you see community media and your work, how do you see yourself contributing to peace? Peace as in, in a wider definition of peace. Not only in terms of solution, but uh, social peace. Like, kind of. Would you see yourself as a peace journalist? Yes. I totally see myself as a peace journalist because my that's why maybe I don't have a problem with moral ethics. Because when I, my intention when I go into an interview is not to be aggressive, it's not to be violent, it's to find a way to find a balance. So maybe that's why I don't have a problem with moral ethics. I definitely see myself as a peace journalist because when I speak to people I want the truth, I want the honesty. I'm not interested in you if you're going to come out and spit out poison in my face. Verbal poison. So I definitely see myself as a peace journalist and the other the one other reason I see myself as a peace journalist, uh, journalist is because I don't see myself as a Cypriot peace journalist. I see myself as a peace journalist and that's why I like to bring voices from Cyprus, from Lebanon, from America, from Rwanda because I think we're part of peace is global it's not a Cypriot prerogative. Like, have you ever tried to reach to a governmental information data and have the you law and get information? No, I don't really have a lot of yeah. information uh, experience with that. Yeah. I ask you another question. Let me skip, skip with the access to information first. Well, there's something comes on the way. Yes, it's yeah. on. Yes, yeah. um, I mean, it is important in terms of uh, like. Just hold on, no, I, I, I do have a problem, I did have one um, run in with access to information because if I had the right information, I don't know if this is the correct, maybe I would have handled that um, aggressive father in a different way. If I knew the law, if the law was made more public, maybe I would have been able to handle him differently. So the, I think one of the things that I need to learn as a peace journalist, 
I do need to learn more about the law. Because the thing that stopped me is he, he claimed that there was a court case, so we couldn't, I couldn't air the interview because that would be contravening. I wasn't sure. So I don't know if that's denial of access to information or the fact that I just didn't have the information. For example, uh, if you go back to the uh, the, the mainstream media and uh, how it uh, affects us, basically, like you are reading a newspaper, watching a TV, like news on TV, and it's all about uh, horror and murders and accidents and terrorists and. How makes you? How this makes you feel? All this negativity, how it affects the society. I think all the negative images we see on television or we in um, newspapers is terrible because I think the more you see it, the more you replicate it. I will always, I very rarely put on my Facebook page negative pictures. I will put uh, affirmations. I will put empowering stuff. I'll put flowers. I think we need to change the pictures we are seeing or the pictures we are seeing need to change because I think the more you see and it doesn't mean I have no empathy or I have no compassion for what's happening in Syria but I think the more we see the pictures um, at least for me the more I see the pictures to me all it is is duplicate or not duplicate uh, increase the negativity I'm not sure some people say that you need the pictures there because people need to be reminded. But I feel the more there are pic negative pictures, you're actually increasing negative energy circulating on this planet, and we have far too much negative energy. So I think it's a very personal, um, it's subjective. It's subjective. I, I might not need to see the photographs because I'm aware. But maybe the people that are not aware need to see the photographs. So I don't know. I can't, that question, I don't think it's got a yes and a no answer. Mm -hmm. That's... Um, Can I ask a question as well? Uh, this is being recorded. And uh, how could people get involved in what you're doing in community media? This would just go out. Well, they must just come to the CCMC. There's a radio, there's a radio station if they want to have a show on the radio. There's always something to do. There's always something to do. If you're interested, you've got to step out of your comfort zone and come to the community media center or the home for a corporation. There's always things happening, but it's not going to happen from your house, from behind your screen, from your laptop. You've actually got to step out of your comfort zone, come and meet a few people, see what's happening, and then you can go back to your laptop and do things from your Facebook page or your Twitter page. But you've got to step out. You've got to come to see what's happening in the climate of the people, what's missing, what makes you crazy, what what drives your passion. That's the only reason, I mean, I would never have got, I'd never thought of radio, ever. And when this opportunity presented itself to me, I thought to myself, okay, what's the worst that can happen? What worried me not that was not that I wouldn't be able to speak for an hour, because I can speak for more than an hour. What worried me is whether I would be able to stay on topic, okay? Keep the conversation not to, because you're on the air for an hour, you can't speak about far too many things. You've got to lay a framework, okay? So that's what worried me. Um, and I thought to myself, what's the worst that can happen? I can try it once, I can try it twice, because community m radio is not, community media is not a signed contract. A lot of it is volunteer, so you try it, it works and you carry on. You try it, it doesn't work, you stop and you try something else. So community media does give you the latitude of actually experimenting and finding what kind of voice you have. Okay. I don't have anything else to say. Do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to say? Maybe... Um, the one thing that it does give um, community media and I think that's the strengthening part of community media or being a peace journalist. And actually, we all used to think that you needed to know someone. You needed to be someone, to speak to someone. Community media allows you the luxury of being a simple human being 
like me, picking up the phone virtually and speaking to whomever you want about whatever you want. You don't need to, you, I, I don't, I sent an email to Eve Ensler. Who am I and who is she? She could have said no, she could have said yes, but it, it, it give, gave me being on a radio station and obviously having an interest in what I talk about and a little bit of knowledge because I, I wing my interviews. There's very few interviews I actually go in totally prepared because I know what I'm, not I know what I'm talking about, that sounds arrogant, but I have a fair base of knowledge and I have a curiosity. So if you're saying something that I don't know, I'll say, tell me. Um, but it does, community media is incredibly empowering because you don't, I don't need to know the man at Sigma who's going to put me on the air. There's a radio station, I can make a program, it can be a podcast, I can send it out on Facebook and on Twitter, I can send messages to whomever I want and draw them to me. So community media is incredibly empowering for ordinary people in the street. What guides you when you're doing community media? You've actually noticed that. I want to say this thing about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. That's the... I've never been in a position except once of having to decide if what I'm airing should be on the air or not. Okay. But I like to believe that if your heart is in the right place, and if you're authentic about what you're asking, whatever you say won't break limits that people cannot listen to. But it's, it's a one way to do things, something you love and speak about, things you love and... and it, no. I want to say something, I can't get it out there. anyway. I've said enough. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, if you, like, you can take your time, I mean, it's not that we are... <laughs> the other good thing about community media, and it's the thing that I think people don't realize, is that you'll be surprised how many people actually want to be interviewed. You'll be surprised how many people actually want to talk. You'll be surprised how many people... I, uh, The stages that I go through with the radio that I think, oh, who am I going to have on the air this week? But the other times that people actually call you and say, I've got something really exciting happening, will you interview me? But now after, I think this month or next month, uh, April, May of 2017, I think it's going to be my fourth, I'm going to close four years on the air. So now I'm no longer Magda Hands Across the Divide or Magda, the general advisory team. I'm now Magda from Kaleidoscope. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say that authenticity, you've got to be authentic. What you do, you've got to be authentic. The minute you're authentic, it's one more reason that people will say yes to you when you ask to speak to them. The biggest compliment I ever got was um, I wanted to interview some woman had come here from the Norwegian Mediators Network and I went to interview them and I asked the people that were bringing them here if they wanted to see hear the interview before I aired it and then Major General Kristen Lund from the third to says to me, no, I know who you are, I trust you, air it. So I think if you're speaking from the heart, if people, if you, and you've got to speak from the heart because if you're not speaking from the heart, people are not going to trust you along the way. You've got to build up that trust. Yeah. People do know you, okay, but you've got to build up the trust. The minute you build up the trust, people come and want to help you. They want to go on the air. And as I said, you'll be surprised how many people actually want